You go first. <laughs> um, I, I started drawing when I, I can't remember when I wasn't drawing. Um, my parents have drawings going back to when I was about three. And uh, yeah, I just always, always drew. I never really thought about not drawing. I never thought about doing anything else besides drawing. Um, and I really have no idea why. And at this point, I literally, really do not know how to do anything else, so. Uh. <laughs> um, same kind of, I mean, childhood. I started writing poetry when I was eight or nine, and then longer pieces and songs, and I knew I wanted to be a writer, um, but I thought it would be uh, in a little room by myself, you know, the, where I could keep my anonymity and have quiet and just send it out into the world, you know. I didn't think about being a performer. When did you sort of realize that you were going to go in that direction? I um, was in Germany. I had been writing songs and made demos of my songs and thought that other people would record them. And then I I, went, I was at the Lee Strasberg Institute, actually. It was just, you know, for three months because I was interested. And I, after three months, I thought, this, I don't want this life at all. I, would, I do not want to be an actor. This is the worst job anybody could have. <laughs> and um, so I went to Germany over Christmas break, and my friend was in the music business. She worked for Areola Records. And I went to a Christmas party with her, and she was introducing me around, and everybody was drunk, and the head of the, she told the head of the label, oh, she writes great songs. And he must have been drunk, because he said, oh, send them to me, we'll make a record. So <laughs> I, um, I sent them to him, and he said, yes, we want to sign you, make a record. And then I went to bed for three days, because I couldn't, I knew what, I knew what would happen. You couldn't just make records and stay in your private room. But some performers do. I mean, not a lot. It's the same thing. Uh, I, you know. I don't know. That paradigm didn't seem an option to me. It yeah. seemed like if you made a record, you had to go out and yeah. tour and promote it and everything. So, you know, at one, after three days, and my friend took me to the doctor. She said she won't get out of bed. What's wrong with her? And the doctor said she's depressed. Yeah. And yeah. you know, then I made the decision. I'm going to make this record. That's not to say that I became a performer by default, mm -hmm. but um, it, I didn't need that much attention. Mm -hmm. So it was a hard choice. What What are the best things about? What are the things you like about touring? And what are the things that you don't like? Well, that airport security is not my favorite, but... Oh. Uh, God, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about attention. Yeah. <laughs> I just lobbed that one right over the plate yeah. to you, didn't yeah. I? <laughs> um, well, it's changed over four-something decades. You know, in the beginning, it was all torture. I thought you went on stage so that people could judge you and that you had to be perfect and, you know, why are they here? And over time, I realized that it's energy exchange. You know, yeah. you're, you're there to create something together in two hours, and it's like a sand painting. It's going to disappear in two hours, and it's yeah. so beautiful because of that. And also... I always quote Bob Dylan on this. He says, the audience doesn't come to hear about your feelings. They come to feel their own feelings. So just make the space so they can do that. And then that has turned into a beautiful thing. I love performing for that reason and you know, touching the far corners of a room. But um, the older I get, the rest of it, the other 22 hours are really hard. Yeah. Yeah, and, and this, this last year has been kind of interesting. I mean, for me, this is the first time I've been in front of even five people. Five people, <laughs> yeah. uh, and because, you know, I've done not the kind of touring that you do, but, you know, book tours, and sometimes, you know, I do a slideshow with cartoons mm -hmm. and stuff like that, and 
um, it was very strange this year. All of that just kind of, you know, went away. Did you find something out though? Because it disappeared. Did you like? Did your work take a turn? Or? Uh, I did other things because there was nothing else to do. Mm -hmm. You know, I had more time at home. Um, I didn't hate it. Uh, I was a little bit panicky at first because for me, it's part of the way I make a living. And, um, yeah. you know, it was a little bit sort of scary, but uh, I don't know. It was, it was very different. Um, I, uh, I reevaluated a lot of things, and, really? one of, and one of them was about being on the road. Like, I started writing some things that I knew I wouldn't have written had I been on tour. Yeah. And it, it scared me. How so? Well, I thought, what else would I have written had I not been on tour? And what yeah. else yeah. <laughs> what else won't I write because yeah. I'll be on tour? Yeah. And how much time do I have left on this planet, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So it was and also I like my own kitchen and yeah. like my own bed. I think when we we were once talking about touring and I think sometimes when I'm traveling, what I like is when I have a little bit of time to do something mm. like odd. Oh, okay. Like do you the, want to tell them the oddest thing you've done recently on the road? You well, she yeah, sent me was, pictures. This was a couple of years ago. I was in, it was actually when, I think it was, it was several years ago because it was when Trump was running for president and I, for some reason, I had a lot of dates in the Midwest and I was like the only person I knew who said, he's going to win. Um, and uh, because I saw so many Trump signs. And anyway, I won't go in that direction. But anyway, so I was in Ohio, and I was in Akron. And uh, somebody told me, oh, if you're in Akron, you have to go to this museum about half an hour away. It's called the Troll Hole. <laughs> and it is this woman's collection of about 25,000 different little troll dolls, you know, with the, <laughs> like, the hair. And I mean, when I was a kid, sometimes they called them wishniks, which I learned was like a different brand of troll, and they were like rivals, and like, <laughs> you know, I learned more about trolls than, you know, I wanted but to. But the pictures to. were horrifying. The pictures, yeah, the pictures were, I mean, I wish I had a, a slide to, you know, no, no, to no, show no. you. They are quite horrifying. There were things like, there were, there were trolls, they were like two-headed trolls. Like this, some they decided to make a two-headed troll. Like horrible things. Um, anyway, so I like when I'm traveling when I get to go to places like that. And and I like my own, you know, kitchen and stuff. But sometimes I think I am so I hate leaving the house so much mm -hmm. that going on a tour it forces me to kind yeah. of get out there and. Um, and do things and see mm. things and like eat in a weird restaurant in Texas that you know has like Texas kitsch all over the place. And I love all of that too. Yeah. It's just that the schedule is usually so grueling for us that yeah. there's not much time to do any of that. I mean, I love to travel for for pleasure. Right. And I'd like to do more of that in the future. Yeah. Well, probably because you have to set up all of your stuff, yeah. and it's it's it takes more time than just yeah, going yeah, through yeah. like a. For me, it's like running through the slideshow and making sure all the tech works, yeah. and then that's one person. You know, I was going to ask you about um, a book that Philip mentioned about. Um, can we please talk about something more pleasant? What's the exact title? Can't, can't we talk about something? Can't we talk more? about something more pleasant? Because. It, w it really interested me that you wrote this book about death, about your parents and death, and did it in such a, not just accessible, but um, kind of full-bodied way. Like it wasn't just tragic. It wasn't um, self-effacing or anything. It was like the full spectrum of what we feel. and you know, everything from grief to relief and in between. And I wrote an album about death, about my parents' death, uh, Black Cadillac. And when I read your book, I thought, oh, I wish I had had more of the lightness of heart to put into it because that would have been a nice balance, another a nice color. I, I don't know how much when you're creating something 
how much control, how, you know, I mean, sometimes uh, I feel like I have this like compulsion to make something funny. So I don't know whether right. like, you know, how much control a person has over their voice, you know? It's true. I have a compulsion to make things melancholy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think because I'm so, you know, mostly depressed, <laughs> um, I, I can't, you know, stand it, so. <laughs> yeah. Do you know, Philip was saying about when he read your cartoons that he felt, uh, you know, he laughed and then he felt anxious. I have the opposite effect, uh, it's the opposite effect yeah. when I read your cartoons is that my anxiety is relieved. I think, oh, there's somebody who feels just <laughs> like I do. Oh, we were having a very interesting conversation yesterday about driving. Oh yeah, we were both the worst drivers on the planet. Yes, worst. We were trying to outdo each other with stories about bad driving. Yes, yes, and how horrible, like the, what are the specific things about driving the that anxiety, bother you? The and like how neither of us had like put gas in our own cars like more than like five times. <laughs> <laughs> well, the blind spot. The, yeah, the blind, blind spot. spot. Just the phrase itself is so <laughs> terrifying. Yeah, it's, it's just, as a metaphor and the real blind spot. Yes, oh, yes. Terrible. Well, it just, I, I mean, for, for me, I didn't learn until I was 38, so I've never really understood. I've always hated it. I've always known, like, I, I don't know why I'm not in New York all the time. Like, there are, there, I, I, 30 years ago, I moved out of New York, and I had to learn to drive, that's why I learned. And uh, it just doesn't feel natural at all. No, I get it. Yeah. I get it. It's, it's anything could happen. Oh, anything <laughs> could happen. You are basically piloting this like million ton <laughs> sort of thing. Like do, 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 I'll listen to this song. And it's like a million tons, it's going a million miles an hour. And everybody else is doing the same thing. And you're just kind of trusting that everything's gonna be fine. Oh look, there's an oil tanker. It won't blow up, you know? It's just like, there, there's a truck with like a million like oxygen canisters kind of like just bouncing around. I'm like, no, what could go wrong? <laughs> you know, this is what is so great about you, Ross, is that your sense of disaster and humor is kind of perfectly aligned. <laughs> it's kind of, I thought you were going to say, kind of constant. <laughs> I think that I would love for you to go through some of my songs and just pick out <laughs> the worst image possible, the darkest, most painful image, and do something fun with it. Well, when you, when you, do you carry like a little pad of paper when you get ideas oh, for sure. songs? And oh, yeah, don't you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's little scraps and it's, it's kind of... Do you ever go back, um, like if some, you can't write, get something right, like you can't quite reach an idea that you're reaching for in a cartoon. So you put it aside and you work, 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 and maybe even years go by yeah. and you go back to that yes. old cartoon. Do you do that? I do. Yeah, I, do. I do that too. Not yeah. cartoons, but I yeah. do that too. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, do you have any kind of like parallel thing? For me, at the New Yorker, for all the cartoonists, there's a weekly art meeting. Mm -hmm. I don't, uh, we cartoonists, we don't go to that, we just submit for that, and the art meeting is basically uh, the cartoon editor and David Remnick, uh, who's the editor-in-chief and a couple of other people, and they look at all the cartoons that the cartoonists have submitted and they choose. We have no control mm. over what gets chosen, what gets published, um, like none whatsoever. It has to go through editors. Mm -hmm. But do you have any of that? Do you have a sort of music editor at all, or how does that Not work? in making records. I mean, in the old school music business, you know, you would have an A&R guy who would try What's to- What's A&R? Uh, artisan repertoire. Okay. Um, at the label, and if you were signed to a label, they would have certain things they wanted from you, mainly hits, right? Right, So right. they would, you know, they'd come in and um, we called them the suits, and they came in the studio, and you know they'd say, "Well, you know this needs to be remixed, and then it'll be a hit, or this needs this, this, this," and we'd pretend to change things for them, and 
then yeah. you know see what happens. That doesn't happen anymore, really. I mean, n nobody kind of tells us what to do. You bring an idea. Fortunately, I'm signed to Blue Note Records, which is one of the great old world record labels. Mm -hmm. You know, Miles Davis. So there's a certain freedom at Blue Note, and um, they just let us do what we want. We have a contract, but they let us do what we want. Now, I'm in another world, which is the musical theater world, because I've been working on this musical for six years as the lyricist, and um, there's a lot of, imp a lot of opinions <laughs> that come in. <laughs> A lot. I, yeah. I was, it really riled me up at first, like, what do you mean you're commenting on my lyrics? And then I realized that this is a much more collaborative effort than I was used to working in. It's a little unnerving. Yes, yes. I had that sort of thing when I was, I once worked on a, an animation project. And it was suddenly, like, instead of sort of working alone in my little studio and then sort of, you know, submitting, it was suddenly there were all these people involved and I had a partner, then there were other people, then there were the suits, you know, who like speed this up, slow this down, actually we want it faster, make it this much faster, you made it too fast, you know, just like yeah, yeah, yeah. so much back and forth and um, it was, I, I didn't really care for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, I didn't either, but once I kind of sunk into the idea that the lyricist and the book writer are collaborators, right? Yeah. And that it's part of my job to drive the narrative, not just write my own nasal, navel gazing lyrics. That um, that was also really fun. Yeah. And I really enjoyed it. So the first two years working on it, I said, I'll never do this again. And the last three, four years, I go, oh, I can't wait to do this again. So what musical theater stuff have uh, have you done? I'm sorry. I Nothing. I mean, we're doing. This is the first one I've wow. done. Wow, yeah. that's exciting. That's exciting. It's and not exciting at the moment. No. It's a, it's just hard, you know. Yeah. And is this something that will be performed? Money. Do you think? Well, we hope so. I mean, we have a team. We have producers. Everything. But like I said, there are so many comments, and direction, and um, you know. Particularly if somebody has millions of dollars invested, they have a lot of opinions. Yes, that's the same with animation. You know, yeah. they're putting, you know, this was for ABC Family, and it's like their money. And so they don't want to just like, you know, some nudnik who thinks she's funny. It's like, no, we're going to have, you know, serious people looking at this and, you know, oh. Do you, do you hate it? Do you like it? Uh, I, I don't know. I mean... At this point, it's not something that I want to, to do. do again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I don't know. Maybe it goes back to nursery school. Does not play well with others. <laughs> you yeah. know, should be in a dark room by self <laughs> well, for the rest of life. Yeah, <laughs> we both want to be in dark rooms by ourselves some of the time. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I look forward to that after working on the um, the theater project to be able to go and write what I want to write, it feels so liberating yeah. and fun. And, right, right. You know. So I was going to ask you, uh, I have so many different questions I was thinking about. Like, um, how has you know, the switch from making CDs and records, mm. you know, how has that changed with you know, digital and streaming platforms and all of that? that? It's such a good question. And People think that's a boring question, but it's all, you know, context, content, it's all part of it. Because it changes, it has changed how people listen to music, right? Very how much they, so, uh, very much so. Delivery systems have changed how, the perception. And, well, one, there's an idea that music should be free, number one, so there's a lot of young musicians who are, who can't make it, who have quit, right. which right. is heartbreaking, you know, it's like, particularly with the pandemic losing a generation of young musicians who were just starting out, uh, it's irreplaceable. But for myself, um, when I, I started making records in the late 70s, so we were still pressing vinyl, obviously, and I would go to the mastering lab and watch them take the mother of vinyl and press that vinyl with my album. And wow. you know, the second album uh, I made we mastered it three days after John Lennon was shot. 
so I went to the mastering lab and I had the mastering engineer scratch Goodbye John into the run out groove wow. of the album. So the first pressing of that album, 25,000 copies, wow. has Goodbye John written in the run out groove. Wow. So every time somebody brings me that album to sign after a show, I say, wait, just I have to look at something. And I pull it out and see if it, mm -hmm. if it has the yeah. Goodbye John. Wow. So that, that was how, and I knew how to record. You know, it was a tactile, visceral experience to move knobs, tape, iron oxides on tape. You're cutting into tape. You were, these things yeah, were. It's physical. It was physical. Yeah. And then it moved, when it moved to digital and Pro Tools, the learning curve was so steep I couldn't, I couldn't follow it. I, I just, and that was a loss for me, to not be yeah. able to sit down and make records physically. Yeah. You know, it's zeros and ones now. Yeah. Um, but that's not to say that I didn't find myself in that. You know, I, yeah. I still find a spot how to do it, and I love it. Um, but then, but the delivery, like I said, the delivery systems have changed how people listen. So now yeah. people don't generally listen to albums in sequence. Completely true. And also a lot of artists aren't even making albums anymore. It's like, well, what's the point? People listen to individual songs. They mix them up on a playlist. They're not right. going to hear the sequence you intended. Right. But right. I found that. I was sequencing, it was a couple of albums ago, and we were sequencing, and sequencing to me was huge. Yeah. It was yes. part of the narrative of making an album. So I was, we were sequencing and just anguishing about the sequence, and I was on Twitter and I said, um, you know, I'm sequencing an album, why am I, why am I obsessing over this? Nobody listens in sequence anymore. I immediately got 100 responses, I listen in sequence. Take yeah. your time. I want to know what your sequence is. But were they mainly old people? Older people. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was thinking when you said that people. <laughs> sorry. I mean, I, I feel the same way. We're the yes, same age. They so. were all old, yeah. Roz. Yes. Yes. No. But it's, <laughs> yeah. But what's fascinating is now kids are buying vinyl. You know, I've noticed yeah. that my vinyl sales are now going up, up. Yeah. And they listen in sequence. Yeah. Well, when you think about the sequence of like Sgt. Pepper's oh my or God, something, how could you it, mix I'll that never up. forget it. It's right. just like, you know, the way the first song goes into with a little help. It's, it's sequenced perfectly, you know, with such care. And uh, But I was thinking when you said that, you know, people listen in sequence, it's not only that. It's like everybody is, because we have these tools for creating and taping our own music, Everybody's the same way. Like everybody's a photographer now. Oh, yeah. Like everybody, they don't just like resequence the songs. They take the songs and sample them and take them apart and like mix them themselves. I mean, there's all kinds of. Uh, I remember there was um, somebody who put together something called the Gray Album. Do you remember that? It was years and years no. ago. It just popped into my head, and it was the Beatles White Album mixed with, I forget. It was. Yeah, was it Modest Mouse? And who was the black, what was the black album? Jay-Z. Jay and it was this incredible thing. It was this incredible thing. And that was like, what, 10 years ago or something? 20? Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, shoot me. I mean, it's just like, it's just, uh, in, so, so now music is almost like, you put out the music, but it's almost something to be manipulated, you, manipulated and taken apart. And, well, yeah, I think not for it's everyone. A, I think yeah. there are still, well, I have to believe there are still people who want to know what an artist's intent was. I, I hope so. I mean, uh, you know, I get sort of, there's, there's a sort of phrase that pops up every once in a while with the visual arts and all other arts of like, there's no such thing as originality in art. And sometimes I, I really disagree. I mean, I think that every once in a while, something comes in which is new. I agree with that to an extent because I think we all build on tradition. Yeah, or well, just to varying degrees. I was going to ask you about that too. Like, I mean, one thing about your work that I love is that it is 
very genre defying. I mean, there's a big traditional country kind of element, but there's also like this very not traditional country kind of thing and very, there's folk, there's jazz, there's a lot of different stuff in mm -hmm. there, and I, I, I love that. I think that's... Yeah, well, uh, you know, I my goal was to make music that didn't have a bin at the record store, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Do you I, know what I, record stores are? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> record? What is it? Rec <laughs> you used to be able to go in and flip yeah. through the yeah. bins, you yes. know? Yes. Afro-Cuban experimental yes. folk Appalachian something. Yeah. <laughs> um, so one, I was talking to you yesterday about one of my favorite um, cartoons of yours, which is the, because it reminded me of myself actually, <laughs> which is the, uh, the vain fairy tale queen. Oh yeah, the vain but realistic. Vain but realistic yes. fairy tale queen. Yes, yes. Do you yes. want to tell our friends here what okay. the? This is a woman, <laughs> a woman of a certain age. She's wearing the traditional queenly garb that you'll see in cartoons with the ermine kind of the yep. dots on, and she's looking into the mirror and she says, "Mirror, mirror on the wall," because the title is vain but realistic. Who, if she had her lost ten pounds, had her eyes and her neck done? a uh, couple of other things in her age group could be the fairest, fairest one of all. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's like. Don't forget the in her age in group. In her age group, <laughs> right, 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> how can we collaborate, Ross? I can't, I've been sitting here thinking, how can we collaborate? I can't figure it out. Well, you sent me that wonderful book with the illustrated oh, lyrics. Oh, that's true. You could do something um, like I that. Did, uh, a book of my lyrics and my friend Dan Rizzi, uh, who's a painter, we did this book together of pieces of my lyrics and his artwork. And we went back and forth and we tried. He draws a lot of birds. He paints a lot of yes. birds, yes. which I love, and also big circles. So we picked out. It's What was fascinating is I couldn't believe how many uh, lyrics I had that referred to birds. Well, birds are our overlords. And you know, the sooner we all realize that, you know, the better. I, mean, uh, I didn't realize that. Yeah, I'm just kind of telling you guys so you know for the future. You know, yeah. Okay, definitely. but back to back yeah. to, <laughs> back to <laughs> how we lyrics. could. I could send you some lyrics, but then I'm afraid that you, know, you would. You could maybe do something. I don't know. Maybe we'll weave a rug or something. I mean, do you ever like have like a crazy kind of craft thing that yeah. you feel like I must. I must learn this. I must learn to weave baskets. I must. Um, I like, sew. I hand sew. sew. Do you? Do you yeah. make clothes? No, I'm not that good. I make kind of folk art pieces, you know. Really? And I call it folk art because my stitches are so bad, so it's folk art. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> no, I cut out pieces and sew on to other pieces and with make words. And oh, I'd love to see that. That would be. I'll show you a picture. Actually, yeah, send me, send yeah. me some pictures. Because you said that you painted for a while. I did. I, um, at one point in the 90s, I was so sick of the sound of my own voice that, and of working with words and notes. I thought, I just gonna, I don't want any music or any words. I'm gonna paint and just see what that's like. And what I found was a pretty probably know is the process is identical to songwriting. Yeah, you mean getting an idea and then sort of trying to figure yeah. out how to... Well, getting an idea, then crushing insecurity about your idea, and yeah. self-doubt, and this inner critic wants to dismantle it, wants to stop, my songs will never be as good as Bob Dylan, why are you bothering, yeah, you know, yeah. and then pushing through. Yeah. Getting in the, this inspiration, yes, I could do this. Yes. And then getting all the way home. Yes. It was the same with painting. It was such an illuminating exercise. It's probably, there's... Isn't that true yeah, for you? It's, it is, except I have deadlines. And so I think for me, I actually, I hate them, but I like them. Mm -hmm. You know, because the thing about not having a deadline is... It's just all on me to decide. And about having a deadline is like, okay, this was a shitty week. 
this is, this is like the worst work I've ever done, but I can't not turn in anything. So like maybe, okay, six or seven cartoons, maybe there's one that is like, you know, it sort of, it, it takes me out of that frame of mind where it's like, just before we're sitting down, it's like, this has to be the funniest cartoon that anybody in history <laughs> has ever thought of. And then immediately, like, everything is terrible. You can't That's right. even think. That's right. It's, the, it's you're so far away from the frame of mind you have to be in to find something funny. Um, it's the same. The, know, you, the perfection kills. It's Or horrible. the need for oh, perfection. It's awful. The need for perfection or measuring up to some imaginary yeah. person who's going to be yelling at you for, like, daring yeah. to, you know. I, did you ever, at the beginning of your career, did you find any resistance to what you were doing? Or was it sort of? Um, yeah. I mean, you know, a 20-something-year-old girl who's working in a boys club. And a lot of men did want to tell me how I should look, what I should record, what I should call my album. And I was just stubborn. I pushed against it. You, you have know? to be stubborn. I think. Really stubborn. Yeah. Not only stubborn, but relentless. I just yeah. pushed against it. I just, even at that young age, as insecure as I was, I still trusted my instincts. That's a, I think that's a really good thing to do. I mean, and, and that way, like, even if you, even if it's a flop, even if you, it's, it's you have to have failures, yeah, right? Even if, even if it's bad, you know, I mean, I think one of the things about making, maybe make, I think making music is probably the same. It's partly curiosity. It's like, how is this going to turn out? I have this idea and I want to do it. And is it going to be better than I think? Is it going to mm -hmm. be worse than I think? Is it going to be what I planned at the beginning? Is it not? It's like something propels you towards doing yeah. this. And if somebody, you know, suddenly says, oh, let me help you do that, you know, you don't really know where it was going to go. That's right. And also you, know? you have to complete the bad idea so you can get to the good one. Completely. Absolutely. You have to, you have to do a lot of bad ideas I think you, I mean my, and I, I certainly have checked that box yeah um, <laughs> my I had a that. friend who was also a songwriting mentor and he just said write everything just just write everything yeah. edit later um, it's very hard get to do the that. bad ones out so you can get to the good ones I think when you're a sort of insecure and a perfectionist um, it is hard it's to very do hard to do that to well, just that's kind of, the discipline though yeah um, and for me, that's deadline. I guess deadlines provide. I love deadlines. Yeah. I mean, I, I do a lot of essay writing as well, and um, they always have a deadline. Yeah. And I, I really love that. Me too. I, I don't like it, deadlines for songwriting. Yeah. For me, it helps, it, it helps the focus, because yeah. a lot of times it's there. It's yeah. just like it takes the deadline for me to focus. Um, and if I have too much time, it's not... It's just not good. I'm not in the right frame of mind. You know what I wanted to ask you, because I've thought a lot about this, that, um, well, Tom Waits had this great thing. He said that he was driving uh, one day on the L.A. freeway, and he got this inspired idea for a song. And he was going 70 miles an hour, and there was no pen and no piece of paper. And he just, out of deep frustration, looked up at the sky and yelled, don't you see I'm driving? <laughs> <laughs> That's very funny. That's very but, funny. I mean, I do feel like that as well. Like, there are ideas out there, and if your skills are refined enough to catch them, you know, yeah. if you've got your catcher's mitt on, if you notice what's going on, you can get them. But... You know, if you're on your phone 18 hours a day, they go right by you. Yeah. But there was another question I was going to ask you. Oh, do you find that when you make, um, like, a cartoon that's maybe not as good as some others that you've made, but you know it's complete? You know it was the best that that one could be? Yeah. Yeah. And so sure. it's satisfying, but, like, it's a little... I, th I think, uh, also, I... I don't know whether it's the same with songs. It's like sometimes I have to get on to the next thing. And sometimes there's an anxiety about it. It's like, sure. you know. You anxious? No. I, yeah. <laughs> I, I want to finish that so I can do the next 
you know, cartoon which I'm more excited about now. Yeah. So, you know, oh, and I it's know like, that. well, I don't know. And, and I guess deadlines also keep me from focusing just on one cartoon and making it like more perfect, more perfect. And then you kill more. it. And then you kill it. Yeah. You know, you I kill know. it and you have one cartoon at the end of the week. And it's, <laughs> you know. I think Philip is saying we could oh, ask. Yes. Yes. You're among friends. Yeah, yeah. Well, let me ask one thing. Right. You said, do you have a trunk full of cartoons that are just lying in a trunk that are never going to see the light of day by the public, and you have a trunk full of songs that you don't want to Oh, yeah. I have thousands <laughs> of cartoons. No, literally. I mean, literally thousands. Oh, um, my God. Yeah, because I've been doing this now for 43 years which is sick, um, and there's an art meeting every week. I'd say it averages, maybe they take like four weeks off a year, so uh, like 48 weeks, and I'm submitting um, six, eight, ten cartoons every week, and then uh, times like whatever that is, 400 times like 40, I don't, now I'm in like math that I don't know. Um, but it's, it's a lot, it's mm. a lot, lot, lot. And I do periodically, like sometimes I'm going through them and I, I'll just tear them up. They're so f fucking horrible and I hate them and I really don't want anybody to see them. But you know, they do, the, the New Yorker only takes, I mean only I do probably as well as anybody there and if they take one a week, I'm grateful. Mm. They, but they don't buy every week mm. and for anybody, and um, that is just a lot of rejected cartoons. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll ask a question. Um, a little while back, I did a conversation with artists about identity in art. And I was asking them to, to what extent or not extent does your social activity feed or hinder your art? Hmm. The first thing that came to mind when you asked that, there was a philosopher, Carolyn Heilbrunn at, at Columbia. Did, did you know her? Yeah. You, did you? I didn't know her that way. I mean, I met her. Oh, wow. <laughs> she, uh, I read her in the 80s, and she said this thing that I have thought of monthly since then, which is that women should live their lives out loud to balance the millennia of male stories. Yeah. That's not to say male stories are bad. I love male stories. But, and see, I shouldn't have even said that, right? I shouldn't have offered a, uh, and a disclaimer. You're right. But um, I've thought of that so much that, that and it gave me courage that um, a woman's life was worth living out loud. And Joni Mitchell gave me that courage, too, when I first heard Blue, that she could write such personal, revelatory poetic songs, put them out in the world as art, and have them be so valuable to generations of people and to the culture as a whole. So those things, um, those attitudes became part of my social identity, I think. And then also my political activism became part of that identity. And you know, at some point after 50, you just go, Fuck it, you know? It's like, I, you don't care. You have so limited time left on the planet. Why are you even caring who's commenting on your social identity or what it is? I'm not even sure what my social identity <laughs> is. <laughs> I, I, mean, I mean it, I know it sounds stupid, but I, I, I don't know. Um, I think, well, okay, I'm from, from this, from Brooklyn, and I'm this age, and I'm this gender, and I'm this religion, and and I guess I don't. I You're don't probably think about it. even 
asking that question is probably answering the question better than I did. Yeah, oh, okay. And then I don't really, I don't know. I, get, I think it probably is very connected in a way that I'm not aware. Yeah, I mean, it's so close that it, you can't see it, right? Yeah, yeah. And as it should be, maybe. Who's? Who's? Both of you. Okay. Now, you all have different hair from my hair. Okay. Um, I love this question before you yeah. even ask it. Yeah, yeah, me too, me too. I ran out of my stuff. That <laughs> what about your hair? Yeah. spend a lot of time on my, I should spend more. <laughs> this, this is a very, this is actually a long way of you are asking me like, what's with your hair? It's really messed up and you should really <laughs> do something with it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the, the gray. Yeah. yeah. Well, being a redhead is part of my social identity, so, yeah. and, and it truly is. I think of myself that way. So I do spend time on it, but not at home. I go to the salon and I get her to do it, and then at home it looks terrible. You know, somebody yeah. did it for me today, so it looks nice. Oh. Yeah. But, but, okay, time, percentage, oh, that's, it's like so much more on my work. The main change is what you were saying partly about people expect content, so much content for free. And I understand that. I mean, I'm as guilty of it as the next person with the internet. It's like, what do you mean there's a paywall? Can you just like copy and paste this for me? You know? Um, so yeah, I, it, and, and I think a lot about young cartoonists and you know how wonderful it is to be able to you know, access so much content for like so little money or like go on Instagram and read, you know, Simon Hanselman or whatever and tons and tons of stuff. But young people, like, how, how are they gonna make a living doing this? I think about that all the time. Yeah. Um, and I consume albums still, listen to it, but then, you know, once I've done that, then I pick out songs I like the best and listen. I mean, we all do that. But uh, what Roz was saying about expecting everything to be free, I mean, it's like if your plumber came to your house, you wouldn't say to him, I'm not going to pay you, but I'm going to tell all my friends how great you are. Yeah. <laughs> you know, which right. is basically what happens uh -huh. in the music business and in your business, oh, too. Oh, completely. 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 And so what is going to happen? I mean, I, I feel like to answer Nell's question and to, you know, the apology I made about men's, I feel like my age sometimes makes me so myopic um, that the world of the future, I I can't judge because I don't know what it is even sometimes. I have mm -hmm. to check in with my grown kids to see what that future is and how I fit into it. And sometimes I don't fit in at all, yeah. you know? Yeah. I'm 66, there, there's a future without me. And um, there's a lot of stuff I'm dragging from my own past that probably isn't appropriate in the present, but somebody's gonna have to teach me how to let go of it. Because I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you both so much. I, I will say that um, I 
would never describe either one of you in your art as myopic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.